helpless damsel in distress. Thank you very much. Um, then we have some uh, other statements. Can you hear me all right here? Is this good? All right, good. Uh, Clark McClelland. I've spoken with Clark a number of times also. He had many, many years uh, working at Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. This is a statement he put on AboveTopSecret.com. If you go to ATS, I, I visit it pretty frequently. He just writes here, uh, I worked at Cape Canaveral in the Kennedy Space Center from 1958 to 1992. There are many mysteries that have been discovered during the years that we have been exploring the moon, sun, and planets. The former CEO of Lockheed Skunk Works uh, was visiting the Cape many years ago. I asked him a question. This is Ben Rich. Ben Rich said, Clark, black budget dollars have taken the USA military at least 50 plus years beyond the present understanding of the general public and how far we are technologically advanced. You have no idea where we have gone out there. I said, Mars, sir? He looked at me and his head movement said yes. Are there monuments on the moon, Mars, etc.? Bet on it. Uh, again, that's a thread from above top secret. You've got the link right there. You can find that, no problem. And then we have the story of Gary McKinnon. Um, in a nutshell, his case is still, it drags on. This has been almost a full decade. And this man's life has been in limbo since he was arrested in November of 2002. And essentially, Gary McKinnon was looking for proof of UFOs and of the cover-up. Um, to call him a hacker is really not accurate, but he was uh, peeking to the extent that he could into uh, various U.S. defense websites looking for evidence of, uh, of a UFO cover-up and what he found on the U.S. Space Command site in, around November of 2000. He found a list of what he said were officer names under the heading non-terrestrial officers. He also found a list of what were, what were called fleet-to-fleet -fleet transfers, which had a list of ship names. None of those names were uh, corresponded to any U.S. Navy ships. Couldn't remember the names, unfortunately. Uh, then was arrested in, uh, two years after that, in 2002. And to this day, uh, he's in danger of, uh, of extradition. His fate is not, it's not resolved. Uh, what's interesting, by the way, as an aside about the McKinnon case, if you, if you study the uh, media coverage, the reportage of his saga, in the early years, uh, the UFO angle was very, very prominently displayed. This guy looking for the UFO cover-up finds XYZ, is arrested, wow. Look up the McKinnon case and, and track the coverage in subsequent years. And the longer we go into this, the UFO thing, if it even appears anywhere, it's at the bottom tucked away. And now he's simply called by the Pentagon uh, the greatest Pentagon hacker in history, which is a load of rubbish. Absolute rubbish. But this is, so in other words, the whole UFO angle has been very, very subtly siphoned out of the story, and that's what it's all about. And the fact is, I think, Gary McKinnon did find evidence of a secret space program. That's, I think, the single most logical conclusion. Then we have some photographic anomalies. Again, this is, this is Richard Hoagland's territory, not truly mine, but hey, I'm allowed to look at these pictures, too. Um, and also, I mean, I would just say I try to, I, you know, I don't want to just blah, blah you to death here. I try to read what people and analysts have to say about it. Uh, I'm not a true phys I'm not a physicist at all. I'm not a true photographic analyst. I know how to look at some pictures a little bit, but that doesn't make me an expert. But this is a very famous uh, photograph. It's called the Shard and in the background of the tower. And in fact, Richard's talked about this, on, about this on coast, I think, a number of times. All he can say is that this object in the foreground, the Shard, is estimated to be about a mile and a half high, two, about two kilometers. And the... Uh, the blur, the tower behind it, about seven miles, ten kilometers or more high. Um, I would say that this qualifies as pretty, pretty darn interesting indeed. Um, I would like for there to be uh, follow-up confirming evidence from other photographic sources, and maybe, maybe they exist. Uh, I'm not aware of them. Nonetheless, they're interesting. They're very interesting. And if I were running a clandestine program, I could bet you that I would be very interested in following up with covert missions to look into that. Absolutely I would. 
Absolutely I would. And there are these other things. Again, this is uh, one that John Lear, uh, again, chatted. I was talking with Richard, I think, about this the other day. I think I was talking with Richard about this. The uh, evidence that John Lear is convinced uh, looks like strip mining on the moon. I have to say the photograph does look something like strip mining. I wouldn't say it's going on today. I don't. Uh, if you compare it with photographs of actual strip mining operations, like, say, this one, I mean, this is a lot more involved. I think the, I mean, I'm not really convinced that that is a strip mining operation, but it does, you know, have a, a kind of uh, at least superficial similarity, and you could say this is worthy of a follow-up investigation. And once again, if I were gifted with such exotic technology that allowed me to go off-world, yes, I would absolutely be looking into that. I would find that to be of enough interest to justify it. And then we have the monolith on Phobos. There's a picture of Phobos, the irregular moon of Mars, one of them. Only recently uh, discovered, as far as I know. It's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, absolutely. I mean, look at that. That's, that's a monolith on the, to, your, to your top right. That thing is shaved off. It looks pretty darn squared off to me. That does not look like a natural object. Not at all. Uh, when Buzz Aldrin talked about it, you know, you got to wonder what's inside the, the Buzz Aldrin's head. I would love, I'm sure all of us in this room would love to have an open, honest, quiet conversation with this man. Because, he, well, he seems to be making these various statements that just are right out there. You know, about being followed on the way to the moon. Well, that's pretty darn interesting. And then he makes a comment on this. But, of course, every time he makes a statement, then he, he runs away from it. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, incidentally, I mentioned his statements previously about his uh, high-level connections relating to ET bodies and technology. He also, I have to say, has really run away from those statements. And he made several of them very explicit. But now you get Edgar Mitchell to talk about this, and he's a little much more, uh, he holds back. And he offers his opinion and uh, much more nebulous statements about the reality of this all and how he... He's convinced that it's real, but he doesn't, he doesn't talk the way he used to. Um, he doesn't make these statements. Same with Buzz Aldrin. So the Phobos monolith, good God, that's a fascinating, fascinating thing. And uh, I would say at this point, I don't know how else to characterize that as, except as an evidence of artificiality. That's my own non-scientific opinion. And then, of course, we have Mars. Uh, and I am in no way going to give you an extended discourse on this, except that I would say that I also feel that what we have is you've got formations that do not look natural. Not to Mr. Hoagland, not to a lot of other scientists, and certainly not to myself. And so whether they're ancient, which I would suspect they are, or whether they're more recent, whatever, it's almost that's a secondary issue in my opinion. The, the bottom line is that these look darn strange, and they don't look to me like they're supposed to be there. So, uh, again, you have evidence of uh, at least a strong motivation for us to break away civilization, to go off-world and investigate. Is it like in Kubrick's movie, 2001 Space Odyssey, where you've got the monolith on the moon? Is it something that, going there, we would discover some great secret? Well, yeah, maybe. You wouldn't want the world to know about it, though, because, um, well, there, there goes your secrecy. <laughs> Uh, the whole thing comes unglued. And again, I'll be coming back to that in a moment. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about a guy who I really think has not gotten enough attention that he, I feel he deserves. Uh, Jeff Challenger, uh, he's no longer alive. He died in October 2007. Uh, I met Jeff one time. He lived in Sacramento, California. Uh, as you'll see in this news article uh, story about him, he was, he was paralyzed. He had a spinal injury and so spent uh, really his adult life uh, lying prone and he devoted himself to downloading NASA links of NASA missions and also those of the European Space Agency and, and Russia toward the end there and just looking at them and studying them and looking for strange things and guess what he found a lot a lot of strange things um, other people have done this but Jeff did a lot of work on it um, the, the, as a personal note, I will just tell you this very odd story. It's totally true. Um, 
Now, I'd been familiar with Jeff's work for some time. His website was called Project Prove. And uh, I don't remember exactly when I became acquainted with him, or maybe 03, 04. And uh, I was a fan right from, right from the get-go. Um, but in the fall of 07, I, uh, I, for, I don't really know why, but I became absolutely obsessed by this man's website. I was telling everyone, you've got to look at Challenger's site. This is an amazing site. It's great. Projectprove.com. Go there, go there, go there. Um, I was talking about his work at uh, various conferences. I was really talking Jeff up. And in early October 07, I was in France. I was talking to some people there about Jeff. I said, this, this guy has got some amazing stuff. And on a whim, I thought, I really, I really want to do a download of his entire site. So I did a rip of his site on a super slow internet connection. It took hours. But I did it. I did the whole site. And uh, the next day, I got an email that told me Jeff Challenger had died. And I thought, wow, what are the odds? Uh, I, I will go to my, my dying day convinced that there is something very, very unconventional happening in terms of our reality that had me focusing on that man at that time. I don't know what it was, but I was absolutely, utterly obsessed with his work. And then he died, and I had his website. And shortly after that, his website went offline, and it was gone forever. I happened to have, as far as I can tell, in the public domain, the only copy of his site, and I asked his widow permission a little while after that if I could put his site up attached to my own, and, and I now have it up there. So I have Jeff's website uh, attached to Keyhole Publishing. Dot com, and I would encourage you to go through it. You could spend a lot of time, months, going through it. You wouldn't be done. This is a two-minute clip of a local news article from California about Jeff, and then I want to show you some of the anomalies that uh, he, he captured and, and put a notice Sacramento man tonight has his eyes on the skies, looking for objects that may be out of this world. What he's found so far will get you thinking about life on other planets. Tony Lopez in the newsroom with incredible pictures. Yeah, they really are. You know, when we see a big, bright object that lights up the night sky, chances are it's the big, bright moon, right? But what if that object is moving? And what if that object can't be explained? Almost a blur. Went under the plane and pulled out in front. Don't call the guy with a pack of cigs and a battery crazy or lazy. A spinal injury means Jeff Challenger spends most of his time in bed. What he sees from his perch is out of this world. All right, well that looks good. Jeff records and studies images from the NASA television channel. Most of it's been uneventful. Most of it. Ran across something that just, whoa, what was that? That was this, the bright object ripping through space. And I ran the tape back a little bit. Watched it again, I watched it again, and I'm hollering on the hall, Hey, honey, you got to come see this. The object caught on tape did not come from, say, the camcorder of a UFO enthusiast, but from NASA during the shuttle Atlantis mission in September of 2000. Since 1999, Jeff figures he's seen at least a hundred of what he calls anomalous events, a fancy way of saying UFOs. Here's another one, recorded during the recent Discovery mission, and yet another. They're not an ice chip, they're not a piece of debris, it's not the moon, it's not a star, not another spacecraft, not a satellite. This is what a real ice chip looks like, Jeff claims. Not nearly as bright as the unidentified object, and you can see the ice chip turn. Tonight you can hear the critics. He wants it clear though, he just spots anomalies in space. It's not time, he says, to welcome the little green men, but he will keep looking out for anything that can't be explained. From one mission to another, you never know what you're going to find. So, Jeff Challenger, who uh, <clears throat> died October, I think October 4th, 2007. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you um, a couple of, oh man, I did it again. We're, we're, no, we're, we're good, we're good, we've got it going on here. I am, uh, I shouldn't be allowed to touch, there we go, okay, good. So uh, this was the clip that they just showed, and um, <clears throat> again, I'll just let you see it a little bit better on a big screen. This is from 1999, STS-96, June 3rd, and you can see in a moment this pulsing bright object going, woo, there it goes, and uh, pulsing very regularly, and there's the ice chip. So very interesting indeed. 
This is a, a clip from the same mission, same day, over Florida. This goes for about a minute. Now, you're going to see a lot of thunderstorms in the center. This is very common. People who've never seen this before think, uh, oh my God, there's a war going on. It's thunderstorms. They're, they're happening all over the world. But what you want to look at are these objects on, the, on your top right moving very oddly. And then he's got uh, highlighted a uh, number of other oddities in Earth orbit. And these are all, of course, looking down at Earth uh, from the space shuttle. The um, guy running the, uh, just determining who sees what on the NASA TV is called the IMCO, and that person can control. Uh, if they think it gets a little too crazy, often uh, they'll black it out like this. But then they, you know, lighten it up. One thing Jeff pointed out is that on the NASA station, there's the a tremendous amount of what seemed to be intentional interference to uh, degrade the quality of the video. Um, and I think he made some sense on that. There are these two objects and others. It's hard, some of them are hard to see, but and the resolution here isn't quite the best. But you can see that there are things moving around that beg an explanation. And this one's almost done. probably let this one go on a little longer than necessary, but I think it's just about done. Let's move on. Uh, <clears throat> now this one, this is actually quite interesting. Same mission next day. Still STS-96, 1999. What you're going to see is a very fast streaking object. It's going to go diagonally uh, from the top, your top left down to the bottom right. It's very quick. You'll see it more than once. And then what you'll see is another object going in the same direction, and it will slow down toward the end. You'll see it happen. So let's take a look here. Keep your eye. There it goes, the bright, fast eye. And that's the other one. You can see it's slowing down. That's a city below. We're going to see it again. That object slowed down. Um, here it is again at reduced speed. Now, you know, I don't know of any dust particle that's, that can slow down or any craft in space that can change direction or slow down like that. Here's something, I don't know if it's the firing of a weapon, but you're going to see two objects moving in a perpendicular way. So one's going to come straight up from below, and the other one is going to miss it, by, but not by much, going in a horizontal manner. This is near the city of New Orleans. So here it is, going straight up, and then the other object going across, at right angles to each other. And uh, we'll show this at slower speed. Here it is, slower. Can you see that? All? You can see that a little bit. It's not, not the clearest, but OK. So let's move ahead. Um, another one, this is uh, from 2000 STS-106. Now, this is a fascinating one, because you will see a definite triangular formation in motion. Um, the sun had not risen at this point, so there's you know, you can't blame it on reflectivity. Um, these objects, as you will see, are in formation, but they're not in a locked formation. They maneuver within, within small parameters. Uh, there, there is a US Navy satellite called the NOS. This is a trio of satellites that orbit. But their orbit is higher, much higher than that of the space shuttle. So you wouldn't see them below. So let's take a look. You're going to see this in two different ways. So first with the uh, objects highlighted. And you can see also how they sort of maneuver slightly within their, within their circle. So it's not an exact uh, maneuvering, but they are in a formation. And now I'm going to show you, uh, this is 50% speeded up. Uh, without any highlighting, but now that you know what to look for, I bet you that you'll have an easy time seeing this, even though it's, um, even though it's faster. Here it goes. There they are. I'll do it again for you so you can see. It's kind of in double time. So here it is again. 
the top one seems to be flashing a little bit more. But they're definitely in motion. There's four of them, but they're in a kind of a triangular pattern. Uh, what are these? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. And here's another one. Same mission, STS-106, September 2000. This is over the city of Chicago. Now here, this is fascinating, because this is going to, you have an audio clip of the NASA commentator. And he is absolutely at a loss of how to describe that bright uh, thing in the center. That's what you're going to be looking at. And uh, it's, it's actually pretty humorous. So here we go. Atlantis is approaching uh, sunrise as it uh, approaches the uh, Great Lakes area. This a uh, this a view of Chicago and also uh, some uh, ice crystals or uh, other items being illuminated by the rising sun. Atlantis uh, moving into sunrise in just about the next minute or so. As that occurs, uh, ice crystals or uh, water that's been dumped overboard from the shuttle is always illuminated uh, in the close vicinity of the spacecraft. Again, that uh, view of Chicago, though, and uh, the shore of Lake Michigan. Yeah, let's talk about Chicago. Isn't that awesome from this space? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, the sun had not yet risen, so they were not in sunlight. And he's trying to make it sound like, oh, yeah, well, it, the sun's almost about to rise. Um, you know, he was obviously not saying what everyone in the world who would have looked at that would have been thinking, um, because obviously he couldn't. He couldn't. Now, this is actually the zoom of the same object, so you can just take a, another look at it. Um, pulsing with uh, quite interesting regularity. And it also appears to me, anyway, that the, uh, the lens is still, here we go, keeping on it. It's moving, zooming in. And uh, that's the end of it. <clears throat> I have five minutes. Really? Uh-oh. Really? All right. I'll do my best. This is an object doing a U-turn. This is my last of the space clips. I'll show it again. Just take a look. Kind of nifty. Now, here's an enhanced version of the same uh, clip. And you can see it actually maneuvering as it goes back and forth. What is that? That's from 2005. STS, I believe, 114. So, in other words, what we have is, I think, a, not a bad case at all for some space anomalies. And again, as I've been saying, a very strong case for a secret space program. So what is the ultimate scenario that I'm envisioning? It's very similar, actually, to what Richard Hoagland was saying in his talk just previous. I think what we have is maybe a not-so-secret Cold War going on. It's taken, taking place in a clandestine manner. But there's something happening. My own assessment, I haven't really told you why, and maybe at another time I will, but my, my assessment of it is that there are multiple groups interested in us and our world. After all, I, th I do think that we're quite fascinating. We're on a technological trajectory that's about to place us into their world, let's face it. It's only been a century since we had a, a, a non-techno society of horses and wood now we're into, uh, well, we're into advanced computing, probably soon AI, nanotech, and the rest. Are we being quarantined? I would say the answer is probably. That's what it seems like to me. I also think, though, that there's not just one human group with one agenda that's in this breakaway civilization that I talk about. My suspicion is that we're talking about competing groups. And they compete with each other for technology and for information. Um, so in other words, a very rich, detailed reality that is being hidden from us. But it won't be hidden forever. Why? Because rapid change in our world is the rule, not the exception. That's the French Revolution. You realize in 1787, even 88, France was in some financial trouble, sure. But who expected that within a couple of years, the king and queen would have their heads removed from their bodies? Uh, the monarchy, centuries old, would be abolished and a republic declared? No one knew that. Nobody predicted that. The Russian Revolution. Ditto. At the beginning of 1917, hey, the Tsar had been on a dynasty that existed for three centuries. The Berlin Wall, the end of communism. Many, all of us lived through that. Happened like lightning. People don't expect these. And we have it today. You have it in Tunisia. You have it in Egypt. You have it in Libya. 
You have it everywhere in the Middle East now. It's not going to go away. And the fact is that just a few months earlier, who here really would have predicted it? Change, in other words, dramatic change happens fast. Change is inevitable. This is what we looked like about 300 years ago. And we had looked more or less like this. We had lived more or less like this for quite a while. But then we got science. And now look where we're at. What's our world going to look like in another 20 years? I don't think any of us can easily predict this. What new technologies, what new capabilities will we have that will enable us as a, as a society to crack this wide open without the help of the powers that be, without the help of these other beings? Because one thing, again, I want to hearken back to what Richard said. I, it's been my own opinion for quite some time. The true dynamic in the equation here isn't these other beings, and it's not the power secret keepers. It is us. We are the dynamic. And that's because we are changing so rapidly. Primarily and most observably, I would say, in our tech technology. But our ideas, our mind is changing. And it is happening around the world. And so we're not going to look like this even in another 20 years. Think back to 20 years ago, 1991. Our world was totally different. So when this secret is opened up, it's going to be forced out, whether it's through a new variation of WikiLeaks of the future um, or through new technologies that will enable us collectively to capture, record, and communicate this in some new unforeseen way. Because I think we'd be fools to say that the world of 2011 is just going to stay like this forever. Obviously, it won't. When that happens, man, that's going to be a, <laughs> a difficult week, won't it? We're going to be asking a lot of questions. Who are they? What are they? People will not be feeling too at ease, I can guarantee you. I don't think I'll be feeling at ease, and I've been waiting for this. I think we'll all have to take several deep breaths. What do they want? What is their agenda? These are going to be front row center, obviously, for the whole world. Um, how has this secret been kept? There's a question. It opens up a whole can of worms dealing with the power structure of our world. How has the academic community been managed, the scientific community, the political media? Where have these guys been? And what is their relationship to the global intelligence community? Clearly, that's going to be a very important question because that's where the answer to that question lies. And then, of course, some of the things that uh, I've been hinting at here. What's the status of our secret tech programs? Where are we at? Do we have flying saucers? Do we go off world? That will <clears throat> open up the existence of this breakaway group that I've talked about. Now, skeptical scientists around the world, well, they're not just skeptical, they're openly hostile to this reality, so they're going to demand proof. I wouldn't want to be uh, the world leader charged with breaking this news. You're going to have a lot of difficult issues to deal with. And then, what do we do? Probably the most fundamental question, what do we do about it? That's going to require leadership. It's going to require great vision and courage on the part of those people who are charged with the leadership of this planet of ours. Energy, to just open up one difficult issue. Because look, energy is one of the core issues behind the secrecy to begin with. Whatever these things used to get around, it's not petroleum. Petroleum industry being probably the largest industry in our world will become poof, there it goes for the most part. It's gone. Um, now that may, that's a great thing for us because we all know we can't exist on petroleum forever. It's just not going to work. But in the short term, you can bet it's going to be difficult to transition, especially for those groups that have invested trillions of euros, trillions of dollars into that infrastructure. Suddenly that infrastructure becomes much less valuable. So what is this new power source? Whatever it is, we're going to, we will learn it. Well, if it's the President of the United States, for instance, that makes this admission, how long do we really think it's going to take before the mainstream scientific community, after their initial shock and spending a week running around pulling their hair out of their heads, they come down and then they figure this out. They'll know that there are answers. They will know there are answers and they will find those answers. And whatever it is, we're going to be using it. And how will that change our world? It's a wonderful thing, and it's kind of a difficult thing. You know, a device that can heat your home forever for cheap uh, is wonderful, but what if it's convertible into a bomb that can blow up a country? 
or more. It's possible. And so this is technology that we have to handle in a responsible way. Enough on that. There's so much more. And I wrote about this at some length in AD after disclosure. Then you get geopolitical unrest. Think about the Middle East today. What's going to happen when those petroleum producing countries suddenly we all discover, hey, we don't really need your petroleum, thanks very much for the ride. Uh, the people in those nations may not be too happy with their political structure at that time. Saudi Arabia will not be able then to buy off their citizens with money like they're doing now. Uh, what about the U.S.? We saw demonstrations of a million people in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Don't you think there might be a march of a million people or more on S4, Area 51, right, Pat? Dugway Proving Ground, Los Alamos National Labs? Maybe. I'll bet you Wack and Hut Security can stop a march of 100 people, but not a million. Not a million. And don't you think that just might happen? And then opening up a new truth movement, because once UFOs, then 9-11. JFK, underground bases, you name it, chemtrails. It's all going to be on the table. My God, what a exciting, challenging mess it's going to be. And so that, in other words, the moment of disclosure is not the end of anything. It's the beginning of the true fight for truth. Not the end. Yes. Now, <clears throat> any political leader, pretend you're, I don't know, Barack Obama, and it happens next week. I don't think it's going to happen next week. I'm, you know, I, I'm not too favorable about all these predictions, by the way, that say, yeah, the disclosure is going to happen, at, you know, whatever. Uh, it will happen, but it won't happen until they're absolutely forced, pressed to the wall to do it, and they'll only do it to control spin and to try to maintain control, but you see, that's where they are in danger of failing. Because think about it. Let's say you're the president of the U.S. or the president, head of the EU, whatever. You've been put into power by these elite groups, you're in there, so you're kind of working for them. But suddenly, you're in a situation where you got like millions and millions of your constituents. They're ticked. They're angry. And you're going to have to make a choice. Who do you side with? The public or the, those Illuminati, these secret keepers, whoever these people are that put you into power, the elites. And it's not necessarily a, a given that a, that a leader will side with those elites. He may, but he may not. He may not. One of my purposes in writing this last book is to show that it is possible for a responsible leader with a grand vision and a positive vision of our world to make the right choice. And the right choice is to side with the people to do it. Can it happen? Yes, of course it can happen. Will it happen? I don't know. But it can happen. And I actually, I am just about in conclusion, so the timing hasn't been too bad. I would leave you, though, with the fact that Whatever the end result of this is, let's not, please, be utopians here. I personally am an idealist, but I'm not a utopian. There are certain things that I believe very strongly in. I have this crazy idea in the, belief of, in the idea of truth. I believe in it. And truth is a real difficult, difficult friend to have. It requires a lot from you, but it's worth it. Uh, if you're sleeping in your home and your house is on fire, but you're having this great dream of being sipping margaritas on the beach and someone's giving you a foot massage. Well, that's a great dream, but it's a dream. Would you rather wake up, deal with the fire? Well, ultimately, we have to wake up. We have to deal with this fire. Keep in mind, our species has always dealt with catastrophe. It has always dealt with problems. People die, new people are born, and we adapt it's really not going to be any different. We're going to have to deal with this very, very difficult situation. It's like a parent who has their first child. Who is ever ready for their first child? Nobody is ever ready for their first child, but you just have it, and you deal with it. And we as a species, as a society, are going to have to deal with this. The ultimate irony of a disclosure of this is that even after 20 years or more, it's quite possible that we may not be an awful lot further along in understanding what we're dealing with. We may have a sufficient amount of knowledge to know that there's something going on. 
But that may be a very different thing from being able to pull all of the documents out of the classified world, being able to get these other entities, whatever they are, to uh, interact with us in something more than the aloof fashion that they've done. So that, in other words, it's, again, it's going to require work. Disclosure is never the end. It's always going to be the beginning. It's also possible, and I think it's likely, that these secret keepers, and far be it for me to defend these people, but they are very possibly scrambling themselves to try to deal with this challenge. I could very easily see it uh, as a situation where they have, they're so far ahead of us, this breakaway civilization, they might look at us and think, how can these people ever adapt? How can they ever deal with the awesome reality that we know? Well, I think that we can deal with it. If they can, so can we. Um, it's all about growing up. You can't be a child forever. And we all love being ch children. And no one really likes to have to take on those responsibilities of adulthood. That's what adolescence is all about. But we get through it. And I do believe we will go through it in this case. So uh, that's really it. I'd like to thank you for your time. These are my websites. Thank you very much. This is the Santa Catalina Channel a 26-mile-wide stretch of the Pacific Ocean separating the city of Los Angeles from Catalina Island. According to experts, these waters, portions of which might be as deep as Mount Everest is high, may contain some of the world's darkest mysteries. You are seeing an unidentified flying object. It is not a hoax. It is real. The film was taken by Leland Hansen while filming Catalina Island from a helicopter. In recent years, escalating reports of unidentified submerged objects, or USOs, flying into and out of the channel have caused great concern to local residents and researchers. The whole area here is just a huge hotbed of UFO activity. I've uncovered probably two, three hundred cases of UFOs flying over the mountains and over the water here. It's just a huge hot spot. Preston Dennett is the author of UFOs Over California. He has been investigating USO activity in this area for almost 20 years. Actually, there was a huge wave of sightings over the Santa Monica mountain range on June 14, 1992. The witnesses counted a total of about 200 objects. What's interesting about this case is these objects came from below. Normally, when someone sees a UFO, it comes out of the sky like a star. They see a star-like object and it comes swooping down. These came from below to above. June 14th, 1992, 10.24 p.m. For almost two minutes, the waters of the Pacific Ocean explode with light as hundreds of bright, disc-like craft are witnessed flying out of the water together. Similar to other reports of USOs exiting the water, these craft emerge from the Pacific in almost complete silence. They reportedly hover for a moment before bursting into space. Reports of this incident were phoned into local police departments as far away as Malibu. The following is an actual call that was placed on that day. Officer uh, Sheriff, did anyone report anything strange tonight? Uh, the one specific, strange, uh, white. Light. Just what exactly uh, happened to you? I'm ashamed to tell you because I think you're going to think you're crazy. We saw what we thought was a bright light up in the sky. Okay. Uh, we could hear it. it wasn't a helicopter. I'm telling you, I have never been more frightened in my life. According to Dennett, the incident was also reported to the U.S. Coast Guard sector in Long Beach which ultimately declined the search request. This 1992 event was the second in Los Angeles in three years. On the dark, foggy morning of February 7, 1989, 